Are you looking at the different types of B12 and wondering which one should I take? What's the difference between hydroxy, methyl, adenosyl, cobalamin, and how I know which one I need to take? My name is Dr. Taranella, and in this video, we're going to look at that question. We'll go into the different types of B12 and when you might think about using each one. As I said, my name is Dr. Taranella, and if you're new to this channel, I just want you to know that I make these videos to help you go beyond the basics of your health, whether it's a confusing lab test, symptom diagnosis, or a question about types of B12. I make these videos to help you get a better understanding of what's going on with your body. So if you like this kind of information on nutrition, vitamins, overall health optimization, click on the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to get more videos like this one. Now for a quick disclaimer, the information contained in this video is for informational purposes only. It's not intended as treatment for any medical condition or a substitute for seeing an actual doctor or medical professional. It should be used as an educational guide to deepen your understanding of your own health and treatment success. If medical attention is needed, don't delay in seeking that attention. All right, let's check out this question on different types of vitamin B12. So in this video, we're going to look at some of the different types of vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 is also known as cobalamin, and it's a complex molecule that plays a critical role in various physiological processes in our body, including production of red blood cells, production of DNA in general, and the overall maintenance of our nervous system in myelin sheath. Some of these different roles of vitamin B12 are supported by the different forms of B12 that are available. So to understand the different types or forms of B12, we first want to look at the overall structure of vitamin B12. And the structure of B12 actually has a lot of similarities with hemoglobin. These similarities between hemoglobin and B12 arise from the presence of a ring-like structure in the vitamin B12, which is similar with the heme molecule that's present in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, if you don't know, is the molecule in a red blood cell responsible for transporting oxygen throughout the blood. And in the middle is an iron molecule. So that's the similarity with B12. B12 also has a ring-like structure, slightly different. Instead of a porphyrin ring, it's a corin ring, but the middle part is similar. And with B12, it's a cobalt molecule in the center of that ring. All that to point out that the molecule B12 is connected together through electromagnetism. So you have positive negative charges that allow these things to fit together. And so you have that cobalamin molecule. And then once it has one of these functional groups attached to it, like a hydroxymethyl adenosyl molecule, it's no longer magnetically charged. It's more of a neutral charge. So these other types of molecules bind to that B12 in order to make it more neutral. So the, again, those functional groups can be a methyl group, an adenosyl group, a hydroxy group, and then sometimes you'll get a cyanide group. And that's not really a functional group in terms of having some sort of utility in our body. Really, that's just a more stable way to deliver the cobalamin molecule. So we have a methyl group, which forms methylcobalamin. We have an adenosyl group, which forms adenosyl cobalamin, and hydrox group, which forms hydroxycobalamin, and then cyano, which forms cyanocobalamin. So those create the different forms of B12, which are important for the various functions of B12. So as I said, cyanocobalamin is not really functional. It just forms a really stable molecule, and that's why it's very cheap to make and also the most commonly used commercially available form. You're going to find it in a lot of supplements, but there is some concern about the cyanide group that's in there. Cyanide is a poisonous substance, poisons our mitochondria, and if you don't have to, I would recommend not using that form. It is still going to provide cobalamin in our bodies, probably can get rid of that cyanide pretty efficiently. But why put that in your body if you don't have to? I did do a longer form video on the impact of the cyanide in the cyanocobalamin molecule. If you want to check that out, it's available on the YouTube channel. So let's go on to methylcobalamin now. So methylcobalamin is the more active form. 
that is used in the methionine or methylation cycle. And it's used to recycle folate and allow homocysteine to turn into methionine, which then can be used to make SAMe and produce a functional methyl donor. So this form of B12 is going to be a little bit more stimulating to the mind and to the body. And so it's helpful for people with depression and fatigue when they're deficient to provide methylcobalamin. However, in some people that may feel a little more anxious or overall stimulated, they may not want to use this form. Adenosylcobalamin is a less common form of B12 that's used in the mitochondria and nervous system. The adenosyl part can be used to make adenosine, which is part of adenosine triphosphate, which is ATP. But one of the key aspects of adenosylcobalamin is its involvement in the methylmalonyl-CoA to succinyl-CoA process. When you don't have enough B12, in particular adenosyl B12, you get a buildup of methylmalonic acid, and that can damage and interfere with nerve signal transmission, cause numbness, tingling, and different nervous system disorders. That's also why a lot of people with B12 deficiency will present that way. That form of B12 is less stable and that's part of the reason why it is more expensive to produce and make. It's oftentimes combined with hydroxycobalamin. So hydroxy is another form of B12, and it is a little less active than the methyl and the adenosyl because it doesn't really have a functional aspect. It just has a hydroxyl group on there, which is sort of like a place saver. So because there is an electromagnetic charge there, the hydroxy group is just going to be added on there. And then you still have that cobalamin molecule floating around. So when you need it, you can add a methyl group or an adenosyl group. And while B12 is generally very safe for most people, and majority of people don't seem to have any problems with it, some do. Some feel a little stimulated or they have various side effects that they can get from taking B12. So for people that tend to feel a little more anxious, stimulated, or just sensitive to things, they may want to start out with the hydroxy form first. Also use that in cases where there's more inflammation occurring or chronic health problems and just want to start off more cautious. So the type of B12 that's going to be best for you is going to depend on what your individual needs are. And while you can take different forms of B12, and it's important to choose one that's likely going to be more beneficial for you, your body can interconvert between the two. So you don't have to just take methylcobalamin if you have a methylation issue and you're deficient in B12. You can take the hydroxy and your body can still create a methyl group that then is helping that methionine cycle as well. So there's different ways that these can fit into your overall health plan, but I just wanted to give you a rundown of how you might think about taking each one of these types of B12. So how'd I do? Did that help you better understand the different types of B12? Hopefully it does. If you do have questions about this or anything related to this topic, drop it in the comment section. I'm happy to answer your question. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.